Hello, my name is Ian Shepherd. I'm a mastering engineer and I run the Production Advice website. And I also run an online course called the Home Mastering Masterclass. Now, I'm a professional mastering engineer, so of course, if you want to get the best possible results mastering your music, then I think you should go to a professional. But I also recognise that not everybody can do that and that not everybody wants to. There are people out there who are just as fascinated as I am by the, the power and the simplicity of mastering. So if people are going to be doing their own mastering, I want them to be able to do the best job they possibly can. And that's why I set up the Home Mastering Masterclass. So recently I teamed up with Joe Gilder and Graham Cochran from DuelingMixes.com. It's a fantastic site, it's a fantastic idea, I wish I had it. Every month Joe and Graham both mix the same song without talking to each other and then they make a video showing what decisions they made and why they made them and they upload those videos plus the final mixes to their website where the members of the Dueling Mixes site can vote on whose mix they like the best. And they can also watch the videos, take, learn from what Joe and Graham have done, what worked, what didn't work, and they get to download the multitrack files and try mixing the songs for themselves. And just recently we tried something a little bit different which we called Dueling Masters, where Graham and Joe both mastered the same mix rather than mixing the same mix, and I mastered it as well. We all made videos. And again, the members of the site, of the Dueling Mixes site, got to listen to the three masters, watch the three videos, and choose the one that they preferred. And I'll reveal the results of that in a little while. So in this video, I just want to give you an idea of my mastering process for that song uh, so that you can see the kind of decisions that I go through and the result that I got. And when Joe first suggested this song as an example for the Dueling Masters video, initially I was uncertain because actually the changes that I make are really quite subtle and quite small. But I kind of thought about it and decided actually that makes it a perfect example because you know the problem is if you go to YouTube and watch one of my videos, chances are somewhere in the recommended column you're going to see a video with a title something like Seven Steps to Fat, Loud and In Your Face. Um, and it's not that there's anything wrong with those videos. Quite a lot of them have some reasonable information in them. The thing that I don't like about them is they give the impression that you always throw everything at a master. So they'll use EQ, they'll use compression, they'll use clipping, they'll use tape emulation, they'll use saturation, they might even use some uh, reverb, they use stereo width enhancement, and you come away feeling like, even though they probably say, don't always use this, make sure the material needs it, you come away with the impression that that's part and parcel of a normal mastering process for a song. It's just not true. When I started out mastering, I was using only EQ and limiting. These days, 90% of the tracks I work on are just EQ, compression, and limiting. So very simple. And this song is a great example of that. Um, so I hope you'll find it interesting uh, as an example of the simplicity and the power of mastering, what you can achieve with, without using all of those reams of plugins and, and loads of fancy processing. So let's get started. So here we go. This is the song we chose to use. It's called The Story, and it's from Joe's last album, Better This Way, which I mastered for him, which made it a logical choice for the Dueling Masters idea. So I'm going to start off just by playing you a little bit of this song so that you can hear how it sounds. I've already adjusted the overall level of the song. There's not really time to go into all of those uh, choices and reasons behind how loud I think you should make things in this video, but I'm aiming for an RMS level of around about minus eight, minus nine at the loudest sections. So here we go. Even past the men I have
So there you go. I think you'll agree that it's already sounding great. It's got a nice big full sound. I think it's maybe a little bit full sounding, and I'm going to come to that in a minute, but Joe specifically said when he sent me the files that, you know, he likes that warm feel in his recordings, so he would leave it up to me to decide exactly how much of that to leave in. So I'll just quickly show you, on the master output section of Wavelab, I have just a limiter. Uh, it has the scary name Brickwall Limiter. That doesn't mean I'm brickwalling Joe's mix. It just describes a particular type of digital limiter that will prevent the signal from going over. And in fact, I have... In this limiter, you define it as a threshold, but it's often the maximum output gain of the limiter. I have set to minus one dB full scale. And that's my current recommendation for mastering. It will give you a good deal of protection if the file gets MP3 encoded further down the line. If somebody takes the CD, rips the audio, and MP3 encodes it, then you will get extra peak levels from the encoding and decoding process. And if you leave a dB of headroom and keep the RMS at the kind of levels that I'm talking about, you're unlikely to get any nasty surprises in terms of clipping distortion from those MP3 files. In terms of the processing on the clip itself, WaveLab is nice. You can have separate processing on each clip in the timeline. So here's, here's the entire album. I'm working on the story. You get a similar setup in the mastering section of PreSonus Studio One, I think. If you're mastering in something like Pro Tools or Logic, then you might have to put each song on a separate track and use different processing in the mixer. It doesn't matter how you do it. They both work great. The key point is you have separate settings for every song not just a global setting for the whole album. And I actually did a blog post about that subject, so I won't talk too much about it here. And on this clip, I have one plugin. It is the TC Electronic MD3 multiband dynamics plugin. And actually, it's not just one plugin because this has multiple functions within one plugin. Uh, we can adjust the levels. We have an EQ section. There's a normalizer section, which I'm not using. There's an expander, which I never use. There's a compression section, which I am using, and we'll come to that in a minute. And then there's an output limiter on this, although I'm choosing to use the separate limiter plugin. I really like the TC plugins. They come with the PowerCore 6000 Firewire expansion unit. That kind of works a bit like the Universal Audio products that you can get. It's unfortunately not available anymore, but there are plenty of other great options for you these days. Isotope Ozone is excellent. Fab Filter and Melder Production make great plugins. I haven't used the Universal Audio stuff, but lots of people like it. I mean, in general, when it comes to mastering, I genuinely believe it ain't what you use, it's the way that you use it. That's one of the themes of the Home Mastering Masterclass. You know, there are certain tools that make things easier, there are certainly things that are nice to have, but you can get great results using a really wide range of products these days. So I mentioned I felt that there was some kind of low mid muddle in Joe's mix. It's not a big deal, but I was hearing it on the guitars at the beginning. I heard a little bit of it on the snare. I definitely heard some of it on his backing vocals when they came in and on the bass guitar. So my guess is that that's something to do with his monitoring or the room that he's working in. Like I say, it's a small thing, but I think tweaking it can make a big difference. And so the adjustment that I came up with was a cut of 2 dBs at 189 hertz. So let me just play you a little bit of the song and I'll, I'll knock that EQ in and out so you can hear what kind of difference that makes. Even though that's quite a small adjustment, you can hear that it's making a worthwhile difference. It's really clearing up and opening out that bass. The other EQ change that I'm making, which really is a matter of taste, is that I want to add a little bit more high mid 
to the sound. That's partly based on the way that the song needs to fit into the rest of the album because there's quite a variety of material on this album and some of it is quite aggressive and rocky so it has distorted guitars and all the rest of it and so to some extent this is just a balancing exercise but also I just I like to kind of hear that I like the the strumming of the guitars to kind of sing out at you I liked a little bit of extra presence in the voice to bring it through so let me play you that so you can hear it that it should be Again, I think you can really hear the benefit of that, especially when all those backing vocals are in there. It just kind of opens things out and gives everything a nice space to operate in and a subtle little energy lift, I think. And from memory, I think that's probably a key difference between the EQ that I used and the EQs that both Graham and Joe chose. Theirs were also slightly different, but I don't think either of them went for that kind of upper mid boost there. And that was just 0.8 dB at 4.35k. It was quite a broad boost though. So I mentioned that I was also using some compression and that is on this tab here in the TC-MD3 interface. And this is a multiband compressor as the name of the plugin suggests. I don't always use multiband compression but I do use it quite a lot and that surprises some people because you will hear people swear blind that multiband compression is, is the root of all evil. That's not my opinion. I do use it in a very subtle, sparing way. I have a configuration for it that makes it sound as much like single band compression as I can make it, whilst keeping the benefits of having different processing in the different bands. And again, there's not time to go into all of that in this video, but if it's something you're interested in, uh, take a look on my website. There's more information there. So I'll just play you a little bit of the song so you can see the compression working in the different bands and see the benefit of that. So you can see at the moment, really it's just that low band that's operating on the kick drum. You've got two, two and a half dBs of gain reduction and that is from 160 hertz downwards. Okay. And now we get to this slightly bigger section, you can see it working in the mid-band as well, and there's hardly any compression happening in the high frequency range. Okay. Now, I could bypass that for you so that you could hear how it sounded without the compression, but the level would then drop. Uh, because I'm increasing the gain through that compression stage and that would fool your ears because most of the time we think that what's louder sounds better. So when you're mastering it's key that you can hear past that loudness deception as I like to call it and it's very easy to do. You can get a loudness meter like the meter plugs Lcast here and you can see that the integrated loudness as measured by the Lcast meter is minus 12.5 LUFS. So that's my level after mastering. In order to rule out any chances of the loudness fooling us, we would also have to measure the loudness without all of that mastering processing. And let's say it came out as 2 dBs quieter. Then we want to turn the mastered version down by 2 dBs. So we're listening to the mastered version and the unmastered version at the same loudness level. And then we're not going to get fooled by our ears making us think that the louder version is sounding better when actually it's just louder. We want to hear what changes the processing we're using are causing and the music and the way that it feels and the way that it sounds without loudness coming into the equation. Yeah, it's okay for the mastering to increase the loudness and one of the key points of mastering is to choose the overall loudness of an album and then balance the loudness of the individual songs. So it is an important issue but in terms of what the compression and EQ are doing we want to be able to ignore that. 
as a shortcut, rather than doing that measurement and level balancing, I'm just going to use my perception plugin. So I'm going to add in the source at the beginning of the chain. And I'm going to put the controller in the end of the chain. And there's another video where you can see perception being demonstrated. So I won't bother to go into too much detail here. All I have to do is play a little bit. And it's actually telling me that there's an increase of 3.8 dBs from all the processing that I'm using in the mastering. So I click the balance button. I'm going to enable the sync feature so that there's no latency caused by the plugins in the chain. And now we can use the bypass button with equal loudness. So there you go. I hope you like the way that that sounds. I'm very pleased with it. The processing I'm using is really subtle, but I think it's quite effective. I think it makes quite a big difference. The, the mastered version, not only do I feel there's that extra clarity in the EQ and the compression is nice and invisible, which is the way that I like it to be in mastering. I, I want things to sound better without anybody kind of really knowing why. You know, I don't want you to listen to a master and go, oh, he's compressed that really heavily or he's done this, that and the other. I, I like to be invisible. I also feel the whole thing just kind of moves quite nicely. It kind of just rolls along a little bit more. The unmastered version just sounded a little bit kind of... It's hard to put into words. I think the mastering processing for me just, just kind of pulls the mix together nicely. It gives it a nice, full, warm, open sound. So hopefully that gives you an overview of how I like to master things. As I say, this is quite a subtle example, but I think that's good because I think there are too many kind of extreme makeover style mastering videos out there on the internet. And don't get me wrong, I do that kind of mastering as well. And there are several examples of that in the Home Mastering Masterclass course, but I much prefer it when what I'm doing is that final stage of kind of polishing. And it never ceases to amaze me, even after all these years, how you make a small change here to one song, a small change to another song, and you kind of go through and the whole ends up being greater than the sum of the parts. You know, the, the overall effect is that suddenly a collection of songs sound like an album. It's still slightly mysterious to me, and, and it's why I love doing the job so much. So there you go. I hope you found that useful or interesting. And of course, I promised that I would tell you what the result was of the voting on the Dual Mixes site between the three masters, Joe's, Graham's and mine. Uh, I think more importantly, I'm going to tell you what was interesting about those. So initially, I was a little bit worried uh, because the when the first 10 or so results came in, Joe was winning. Uh, Joe was definitely the preferred master. But once the voting had been going on for about a week, and I think the majority of the members had voted, I didn't check in for the final, final count. But the last time I looked, my master was preferred by, I think, about two thirds of the people. So twice as many people liked it as, as Joe or Gramps. And given that I'm a professional mastering engineer, I was pretty relieved that that was the case. But what really fascinated me was when you think about that result and then you compare the different masters and the things that were different about them, Graham's mix was a lot louder than either mine or Joe's, meaning he had pushed the RMS level up against 0dB. He had more limiting going on, so he had 
less peak to loudness ratio in his music. That's the kind of thing that happens all the time because of the loudness wars. And the reason people do that is because they think that listeners prefer it. And the result of this vote would seem to be listeners don't prefer it. I'm not saying that Graham's Master sounded bad, but the loudness wasn't a factor for the people voting in this case. The other interesting thing is that Joe's mix didn't win either, and his was slightly more dynamic than mine. It had a couple more dBs uh, room to, to breathe. Still sounded great. But again, that gives you the information that it's not about the most dynamics winning either. I've always said, for me, it's all about balance. And actually, I think in this case, the thing that swung it for my master was probably the EQ. I had some subtly different things going on in the EQ of my master than either Joe or Graham. And that might be because of my preference. It might be because of my monitoring and my room. For whatever reason, people resonated with the choices that I made. I think another interesting thing to take away is that Neither of the three masters sounded radically different from the other. You know, they were all recognisably the same song. I think they all would have worked. I don't think they would have had any complaints if any one of those masters had gone out into the world as the final version. And I think the final thing that I was really pleased to see was that both Graham and Joe used my perception plugin to do loudness matching on their masters. You know, you don't have to use the plugin. You can do it yourself using loudness meters. But they, they've they been reading my website. They've been listening to me going on about it for years. They understand the point. They get it. They know how important it is to compare before your processing and after your processing with the loudnesses matched so that you get a true impression of how your music sounds. And I think if there's one thing that you take away from this video, that would be what I would suggest you, you lock on to. Uh, the quicker you get into loudness matching your reference tracks and your processing the sooner you're going to really zero in and get that kind of x-ray vision for your mixes and masters and be able to get even better results it's such a simple technique but it's so powerful so thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed the video uh, please head over check out my website productionadvice.co.uk there's a load more information there Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to get future updates. And of course, check out duelingmixes.com. I, I so wish it had been my idea. Uh, that's it. My name's Ian Shepherd. Thanks for listening.